بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم رسپیکٹڈ ویورس وی آر ونس اگین بیک ود یور فیوریٹ کرنٹ افیئرس پروگرام بیکن ان دس پروگرام وی ٹیک اے لیڈنگ سوشیو پولیٹیکل ایشو انوائٹ اے اسپیشل گیسٹ ٹو ڈسکس دیٹ ایشو ان ڈیٹیل سو دیٹ آر ویورس کین گین اے بیٹر ان سائٹ آ ٹو ڈیز ٹاپک از سعودی عربیہ پاسٹ پریزنٹ اینڈ فیوچر وی آر آل اویئر اباؤٹ دی ایکسٹریمسٹ ریلیجس آئیڈینٹی وچ سعودی پوزیسڈ فار ڈیکیڈس انڈر دا گائز آف اہابیزم سیکٹ وی آر دے پروموٹیڈ سپورٹیڈ اینڈ اسپریڈ ٹیررزم ان ویریس پارٹس آف مسلم ورلڈ اینڈ ایون ریچڈ یورپ اوور لاسٹ ٹو ایئر سعودی ہیز بین چینجنگ اٹس پالیسی اینڈ محمد بن سلمان ہیز ریزائنڈ ہز نیشن فرام وہابیزم اینڈ موونگ ان ٹوٹلی اپوزٹ ڈائریکشن آف لبرلزم اینڈ وانٹ سعودی ٹو بیکم دا موسٹ لبرل مسلم کنٹری in Middle East, leaving UAE behind. What is the background to this? Where all this is heading towards and where will it end? To answer these questions, we have invited a very special guest, Dr. Zafar Bangash from Canada. Zafar Bangash is a noted Islamic movement journalist and a commentator in Toronto, Canada. He is director of the Institute of Contemporary Islamic Thought and on the editorial board of Crescent International, the world's longest running Islamic movement magazine. He is also Imam at the Islamic Society of York Region's Mosque and Community Centre in Richmond Hill, Ontario. Dr. Zafar Bangash is a strong supporter of Islamic revolution and has been promoting the ideology of Imam Khomeini globally amongst Muslims. Assalamu alaikum Dr. Zafar. We warmly welcome you to our program and hopefully you are doing well. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah and I hope that all of you in the studios over there are well as well. It's our pleasure to invite you to our show today and we hope our viewers will gain a lot from your deep political insight. As you're aware, our topic today is related to Saudi Arabia, specifically the wave of liberalism that has started in Saudi over the last few years under the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. We would like to start with our first question. Saudi historically has been an extremist religious nation and globally the Muslims have very high respect for Saudi due to her men, the Holy Kaaba and Prophet's shrine. This has also given Saudi a mileage to be a sort of leader of Muslim Ummah. So now, all of a sudden, in a very short period, Saudi has moved towards liberalism. That too, by publicly denouncing Wahhabism, not taking gradual but rapid steps. What do you consider as the real background behind this move? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. With respect to the Saudi drive towards so-called liberalization, is the fact that there is a young man, inexperienced, impulsive, um, prone to bouts of anger and other uh, temperamental problems that uh, most of his policies uh, since he became the crown prince, or in fact, as soon as his father took over the kingship, King Salman, uh, he was uh, Mohammed bin Salman was appointed uh, defense minister as well as uh, chief of the royal court. And he was basically the de facto ruler. And since he was very young and inexperienced, and there were a number of other uh, princes that were uh, senior to him and much more experienced, and they had a lot more contacts worldwide, uh, Mohammed bin Salman had to embark on various policies in order to ingratiate himself to the West. What he basically calls liberalization and his uh, uh, media supporters in the West call liberalization is not actually liberalization. It is vulgarity that is being introduced in the Saudi society that had for at least uh, 90 years been uh, following a very strict religious uh, interpretation of Islam and they basically pretended to be the leaders of the Muslim world. So these policies of liberalization, uh, so-called liberalization, are actually policies of vulgarity that Mohammed bin Salman is pursuing in order to gain acceptance in the West uh, because he understands that if he has acceptance in the West, that he would be able to uh, become the king 
and continue as the ruler of Saudi Arabia. Uh, and of course, you know, as I mentioned, this liberalization is actually uh, vulgarity. Uh, he's introducing, for instance, uh, these uh, Western style concerts. As we speak, there are concerts going on in Jeddah. They started in 2019 and um, in 2021, they started in October. They will continue all the way up to March of 2022 in which hundreds of thousands of people participate, especially men and women, um, without hijab, na mehram, mixing freely, dancing, and even uh, alcohol consumption, etc. This is what he is referring to as liberalization. And of course, this is something that is prevalent in the West as well. So this is the route that he thinks he is going to follow in order to gain acceptance in the West. But sir, were these royal family, prince and kings, liberal from before and just for political reasons they were promoting Wahhabism or they were all strictly religious before, but now for political gains and political profit, they have become liberal. Which way it is? Well, basically, uh, in the past, uh, when they followed this uh, very narrow, archaic interpretation of Islam, this was based on the fact that back in 1744, when these um, Saudis, Bani Saud, erupted from the Ria, uh, the backwaters uh, of Najd, uh, they struck an alliance with uh, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab. And the, the deal was that the Bani Saud would be in control of worldly affairs, and Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and his followers would be given. Uh, authority in religious matters. And uh, this compact, of course, um, served them well because they went around the world trying to project themselves as being very religious and so on. And this image, of course, was boosted by the fact that uh, Mecca and Al Madina are located in the Arabian Peninsula in the Hejaz, which the uh, Saudis um, occupied in 1924 and 1925, respectively. And Muslims worldwide naturally have great reverence for the Haramain. And of course, Makkah is the first uh, house of Allah on earth. And Medina al Munawwira is <clears throat> the resting place of uh, the noble messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And so Muslims have deep respect and reverence for these two places. And as a consequence, they extended this reverence to the Saudi rulers as well. In fact, it was quite, um, uh, you know, quite uh, strange because the Bani Saud were never really uh, religiously oriented. They continued to indulge in all kind of vulgar conduct. There is, in fact, an episode back at the time of uh, uh, King Fahad. He was an alcoholic. He used to do all kinds of other Fahash things uh, when he used to import alcohol uh, from Europe and other places around the world, um, these uh, huge crates would be marked as religious books. Uh, this is well documented, this is well established. And, and they continue to indulge in this kind of behavior even before, but they put up this facade of Islamicity so that they could fool the Muslims of the world to pretend that they are really custodians of the two holy places, and that uh, they are following the, the rules of Islam. They also did other things. For instance, uh, the Saudis went around the world. They were flushed with money, with petrodollars. They spent this money uh, buying people's loyalties all over the world, including in Pakistan, in India, in Bangladesh, in part, many parts of Africa, in uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, etc., you name it, and they went and bought loyalty of the people, including North America, incidentally. And, and there are, of course, you know, many, many uh, communities, etc., in North America where uh, the Saudis have invested heavily and uh, they have bought people's loyalties. Now, of course, things have changed since 9-11, but they, they bought these um, people's loyalties at that time. So... Even in the past, the Bani Saud were not truly uh, committed to Islam, although their constitution, which was given by King uh, Fahad back in 1992, it states in Article 
5C of the constitution, that the constitution of Saudi Arabia would be the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I think if we review their policies, they have nothing to do with the Quran. They have nothing to do with, with the, uh, the Prophet's uh, Sunnah or Seerah. Uh, in fact, their policies have always been contrary to the teachings of Islam. There are two very simple facts. Number one, that um, uh, there is no kingship in Islam. Uh, number two, that uh, an Islamic country cannot be subservient to the kuffar. And we see that uh, the Saudi regime violates both these injunctions. So any country that calls itself kingship is automatically un-Islamic. It cannot be accepted as Islamic. And if it is subservient to the kuffar, whether it's the U.S., Zionist Israel, or other you know, members of the kuffar fraternity, then again, they are uh, outside the fold of Islam. So Saudi Arabia had never followed Islam. It was just a facade that they presented to the world to fool the Muslims. And of course, they bought the loyalty of Muslims worldwide. Well, sir, all those who have been visiting Saudi, specifically the Jeddah region, where there is Mecca and also Medina, they find Saudi people being strictly religious and very conventional. So how do you think the Saudi mass will react to this big change coming in? Well, there are uh, several questions uh, that need to be addressed one by one. The first question with respect to the people that live in the Hejaz. It is true that the people of Hejaz are different from the people in the rest of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, the people of Hejaz, obviously, because of the fact that they live in Mecca and Al Madina, uh, have a different uh, approach and inclination to Islam. Uh, in particular, I would say in, in Medina, there are, in fact, um, uh, many people, uh, they are very good Muslims. They adhere to the uh, teachings of Islam. They have deep love for the noble messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. They even in the past uh, and still do, they, they, they organize um, milad programs, but in their homes because the Saudi regime does not allow these kinds of celebrations to take place. So this is one aspect. With respect to the reaction of the people, uh, let me first of all explain that uh, in what is referred to as Saudi Arabia, uh, what it implies is that this uh, Arabian Peninsula that uh, was named Arabian Peninsula by the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the Saudis have changed its name to Saudi Arabia, as if to say it is owned by the Saudi family. Now, of course, in the Arabian Peninsula, there are many, many different tribes, not just the Saudi clan. There are many different tribes. So number one, by them declaring this Arabian Peninsula as Saudi Arabia, it is a mega bidah. Bidah is a word that they use, the Saudis use very liberally, but they are actually, or they have indulged in a mega bidah by changing the name of the Arabian Peninsula to Saudi Arabia, number one. Secondly, there have been, over many years, uh, scholars in the Arabian Peninsula uh, who have objected to the policies that the Saudi regime is pursuing. And in particular, uh, since King uh, Salman, or Salman became the king and his son, Muhammad bin Salman, became the de facto ruler, and the kinds of policies that he is pursuing uh, these have aroused concern among many scholars. These are religious scholars. These are academics. These are lawyers. Even prior to that, actually, uh, there were scholars. They've been languishing in prisons. I can tell you right now, as we speak, there are thousands of political prisoners in jails in Saudi Arabia. Last year, that is 2021 in October, Sheikh Musa al Qarni, a well known, respected scholar in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, died in prison, in Zahban prison, which is in Jeddah. Right now, there is um, uh, Sheikh uh, uh, al Auda, Salman al Auda, who was arrested in September of 2017. And why was he arrested? Because in one of his, uh, after one of his prayers, he prayed 
that may Allah reconcile the hearts of the people and rulers of Saudi Arabia and Qatar. And this was immediately after the Saudi regime had uh, uh, embarked upon a siege and blockade of Qatar in order to uh, bring the, the Qatari regime under Saudi control. There has been a long simmering dispute, border dispute between Qatar and Saudi Arabia, and Qatar also vies for some kind of prominence uh, in the region. And this is something that Mohammed bin Salman uh, is, was not prepared to tolerate. So he imposed a siege. Uh, the UAE, Bahrain, Egypt, Jordan, they all joined uh, Saudi Arabia in imposing a siege. But thanks to the support of uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran and Turkey, Qatar was able to uh, weather that siege and came out much stronger. Now, when Sheikh Salman al Auda prayed that Allah should reconcile the hearts of the Saudis and the Qataris, he was arrested and charged with sedition and disloyalty to the kingdom. And in fact, the prosecutor even called for a death sentence for him. So we see that there are these kinds of uh, atrocities, these kinds of um, uh, imprisonments taking place. There are many women that are in prison. Uh, in fact, you know, one of them, Samar Badawi, is well known. She was arrested in 2018. And what was her crime? She called for allowing women to drive cars and for women to have the right to vote. Now, of course, in Saudi Arabia, there is no such issue as, as voting to, to elect the king uh, or elect you know, the government. Basically, they have a consultative assembly in, in which they offer advice. And the women, and Samar Badawi simply asked for women also to be given this right, and she was thrown in prison. She has been tortured. There have been other atrocities that have been committed against women. These are documented by human rights organizations. So that's the second aspect of, of the, uh, of the uh, issue or the environment in uh, Saudi Arabia. The third, with respect to the question whether there have been any uprisings of the people. Now, we know that in the eastern provinces of Saudi Arabia, there have been repeated uprisings because the people over there are unhappy. They are predominantly Shia, but they are still citizens of Saudi Arabia. They have asked for equal treatment under the law. And instead of providing that, we know that back in 2016, in fact, this month, January, is the sixth anniversary of the martyrdom of Sheikh Nimr, Al Nimr, who was uh, executed by the Saudi regime because he had simply asked for basic rights for the people of, his, of the eastern provinces. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Saudi Arabia is not just the Bani Saud clan. Uh, in fact, there are many other tribes in Saudi Arabia that have been totally marginalized. Of course, the leaders have been paid enormous sums of money but the people have been marginalized. And given the fact that Saudi Arabia is such a tight society, the, the Mukhabarat, the intelligence agencies operate uh, everywhere, and anybody who even whispers any criticism of the regime is immediately accused of sedition, of trying to overthrow the government. They are thrown in prison, they are tortured, they are killed. And of course, there is no uh, judicial system as such. There is no codified law in Saudi Arabia. Uh, whatever the whim of the judge, that's the law. And the judges often uh, follow what they think the ruler wants them to follow. So in that sense, uh, there, it is unrealistic to expect that there is going to be any uprising from the people. And as we mentioned earlier, this uh, campaign of vulgarity that the, that the Saudi regime has embarked upon, this is to divert the attention of their people uh, to introduce a hedonistic culture to them so that they would be engrossed in these vulgar activities and they would not think about the legitimacy or in fact the illegitimacy of the regime. And so they want, they, the Bani Saud clan uh, wants to prolong its uh, existence in power. But with respect to any uprisings, I think that is unrealistic. What is more likely to happen is that because of the uh, the war, the vicious war that uh, Mohammed bin Salman launched against Yemen, that that war might come to haunt him because uh, the Ansarullah fighters in Yemen are putting up a brilliant resistance despite lack of weapons. 
what they lack in weapons they, they make up in iman and so far they have stood their ground and they have even launched attacks against uh, military installations inside saudi arabia and the longer this war uh, continues the more sophisticated and powerful ansarullah will become and that might actually lead to some kind of a revolt within the saudi army itself but regrettably i'll have to say that unfortunately as far as the people of saudi arabia are concerned they are not like to to rise up against this a uh, despicable regime any time soon right sir globally even though muslims have liberal views spread across but still there is a huge number of practicing muslims who do not consider things like non enforcement of hijab like casinos alcohol dance concerts nude beaches adultery as uh, acceptable and so these enforcing these evil traits so what would or is this the global impact of these liberal moves by saudi on global muslims will they still consider saudi as their ideal or they will distance from saudi well you know uh, in found muslims have uh, uh, never cons- uh, considered uh, saudi arabia as the leader of the muslims uh, you know uh, both uh, uh, here in north america in europe in other parts of the muslim world i mean i can mention to you a number of countries in in the muslim world particularly places like uh, malaysia and indonesia for instance um of course regrettably uh, pakistan is a sad case sad because uh, there has been a tremendous uh, negative saudi influence in society although there are many groups and organizations in pakistan that are deeply troubled by what the saudi regime um is doing and has been doing in the past so with respect to the uh, acceptance of saudi arabia as the leader of the muslims i think uh, that is a um, really a, a propaganda tool that the saudis have used because they have used their enormous wealth to buy people's loyalties you know i was personally struck by the fact that um until a few years ago there was hardly any criticism of saudi regime policies in uh, pakistani media but now it has started i recall back in 1985 uh, we in the crescent international magazine had published a, an editorial criticizing saudi policies and this editorial was reproduced by a pakistani newspaper in islamabad and of course the intelligence agencies and the information ministry immediately contacted the editor of this newspaper and threatened him saying that you are trying to disrupt pakistani relations with saudi arabia by publishing this uh, article in your newspaper and the poor editor had to explain to the information ministry officials that well we this is not something that we wrote this was published in a crescent international magazine which is published from toronto canada and we simply reproduced it but the editor he told me personally he said that he was uh, he was threatened and he was told that he should not uh, re- even republish such articles but now we see a very different situation in pakistan at least the the english uh, uh, media that i scan and read i find that there are articles that are critical of the saudi regime so we see that the tide is turning that people even liberal muslims are horrified by the vulgarity that the saudi regime is uh, pursuing and indulging in uh, you know on the red sea coast they are as going to establish a uh, a holiday resort basically a beach where uh women can go around in bikinis alcohol would be served gambling is allowed all kinds of other vulgarities uh, will take place the saudis are now basically competing with dubai in seeing who is going to be more vulgar and so unfortunately this is a very negative trend and the more muslims become aware of it the greater would be their revulsion against the policies of the saudi regime I interrupt you but uh, in some countries like in pakistan if a person is uh, saying something against saudi arabia or denouncing saudi arabia it automatically means that the person is uh, supporting iran and is this situation where people are becoming aware of the atrocities of injustice of uh, saudi arabia do you see that in countries like pakistan as well 
uh, and for the whole Muslim world, Iran is going to be the new leader of Muslim Ummah? Actually, Iran already is. I mean, you know, it's not just emerging, it already is. Uh, when we look around the world uh, and, and the various um, challenges that uh, Muslims face, uh, the only country in the world that is supporting those movements, uh, look at, for instance, Palestine and, and Masjid al-Aqsa. Both are very close to the hearts of Muslims worldwide. It is no matter what uh, you know persuasion the Muslims may be, but Palestine and uh, Masjid al-Aqsa are very close to the hearts of Muslims. I mean, after all, Palestine has is referred to as the Holy Land. It is the land of the prophets, and so in that sense, Iran's support for the Islamic struggle and the struggle of liberation of Palestine has earned it enormous goodwill. The same applies to Iran's support for, for instance, uh, Hezbollah's right to defend itself against Zionist aggression. The same applies in Syria. It has been Iran's help that has enabled Syria to withstand this Zionist imperialist uh, Saudi conspiracy to destroy Syria. Syria has been destroyed, but at least the government is still intact. The same applies in Iraq, where these Daesh terrorists uh, were defeated through the help of um, Iran, and in particular, uh, Shaheed General Qasim Soleimani, whose anniversary is today, the second anniversary. And there have been programs all over the world to commemorate the martyrdom of General Qasim Soleimani. So the issue in the Muslim world is no longer Shia and Sunni. The issue in the Muslim world is who stands up for the rights of Muslims? And the only country that stands up for the rights of Muslims is the Islamic Republic of Iran. And in that sense, it is the leader. I think my request, humble request to uh, the people of Pakistan would be, uh, and I come, incidentally, I come from a Sunni background, that we should rise above these petty sectarian differences, that we should see who stands up for truth and justice and who is siding with the oppressors and the tyrants and the kuffar and the imperialists and the Zionists. And I think any thinking Muslim would clearly come to the conclusion that today it is only the Islamic Republic of Iran that is standing up with these oppressed uh, people all over the world. Uh, and Saudi Arabia actually under its current uh, rulers uh, have sold themselves to, they were all always uh, the puppets of the imperialists, that is the Americans. Prior to that, they were puppets of the British colonialists because they created uh, the Arabia, the Saudi regime. And they have also now sold themselves to the Zionists. Uh, in October of last year, of October 2021, the Jerusalem Post had carried a report that a Saudi plane had visited Tel Aviv, had come, gone to Tel Aviv, and then a commercial plane. And then uh, it was followed by the Israeli airline El Al uh, taking a flight to Riyadh. This was published in the Jerusalem Post. Now, let us remember, Saudi Arabia and Israel do not have formal diplomatic relations. So what were their civilian airliners doing traveling to each other's capital cities? Obviously, there is a lot going on beneath the surface that has not come out because the Saudis are afraid that if they were to uh, declare their open uh, their their diplomatic relations openly with the Zionist regime that there is going to be a tremendous negative reaction worldwide um, uh, among Muslims as well as incidentally non-Muslims. There are many many non-Muslims that do not consider Israel to be a legitimate en entity. They consider it it a usurper colonial entity that is illegally occupying the land of the Palestinian people. So in that sense. Uh, Muslims worldwide uh, can see that the Saudi regime does not represent the interests of the Muslims, that it is doing everything that goes contrary to the interests of the Muslims. I mean, after all, why would a Muslim country an attack another Muslim country? I mean, that's what the Saudis are doing in Yemen. They have killed hundreds of thousands of people, according to UN figures. A million children have, have been afflicted by cholera. There are literally uh, Half, more than half the, the Yemeni population is on the verge of starvation, according to the United Nations itself. And so these horrors are being perpetrated by the Saudi regime 
on innocent Muslims in Yemen. And those Muslims that have a little bit of uh, knowledge and understanding of global affairs clearly see that, unfortunately, the Saudi regime is nothing but acting as the agent of imperialists and Zionists, and therefore as the enemy of Muslims. And it cannot be a leader of the Muslims. The world knows the barbaric past of Saudi. They know the present as well, where their barbarism continues in Yemen. And at the same time, they have become liberal as well. What do you foresee as the future for Saudi? Will there be a rebellion and this royal family will get eradicated and Saudi will regain its Islamic identity? Or we have to bid farewell from Islam completely in Saudi? Well, basically, what I see is that um, uh, so long as uh, King Salman is alive, that inside uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, the ruling family remains silent. But I see that uh, once King Salman is dead, although he's uh, currently completely out of action, he suffers from Alzheimer's, he suffers from other ailments, he has not been seen in public, uh, uh, he's unable to walk properly. Uh, I think that there is likely to be uh, a major struggle for power within the ruling family itself. As I mentioned earlier, there are a number of uh, Saudi princes that are senior to, much senior to Mohammed bin Salman, uh, and they're not likely to uh, take it uh, lightly. For instance, there is a prince by the name of uh, Prince Ahmed bin Abdulaziz. Uh, he is an uncle of Mohammed bin Salman, and according to the Saudi constitution, for all it's worth, it's not really much of a constitution, but anyway, it states that uh, when the king dies or is incapacitated, that he must be succeeded by the next brother in line. Now, obviously, uh, Mohammed bin Salman is uh, not the king's brother, he's the king's son. So there is a Saudi prince, uh, Prince Ahmed bin Abdulaziz. There is also another prince, Mukrim bin Abdulaziz, that are alive. Uh, and there is um, uh, uh, Prince Talal bin Abdulaziz. So there are a number of princes that are brothers of King Salman that are alive that would be that would have a greater claim to the throne than Muhammad bin Salman. The real deciding factor, I believe, would be what the Americans uh, decide because Saudi Arabia is essentially an American colony. If the Americans find that Mohammed bin Salman is becoming too much of a burden for them, we must not forget that it was Mohammed bin Salman's order, it was on Mohammed bin Salman's orders that Jamal Khashoggi was murdered in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul in October of 2018. And because the Turkish government has pursued that case vigorously, that murder of uh, Jamal Khashoggi, although carried out by Saudi agents, but it was on the express orders of Mohammed bin Salman, even the CIA has said so, then if the Americans think that Mohammed bin Salman is going to be too much of a problem for them and he would bring too much negative baggage, then they might get rid of him and impose somebody else. But the future of this ruling family is not uh, certain. It is not very bright. Uh, it is possible that Mohammed bin Salman might succeed because he has imp imprisoned a number of his rivals. Uh, he has uh, made a lot of changes in the intelligence agency, in the interior ministry, etc. But we cannot rule out an internal power struggle in the ruling family itself. With respect to uprising by the people, again, as I said earlier, that I do not foresee because, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the, the people have been now, particularly the youth, have been uh, led on a path of vulgarity. And unfortunately, these people are quite happy indulging in this uh, vulgar lifestyle rather than um, uh, you know, seeing the truth. Uh, that doesn't mean that there are no... Uh, uh, decent people in Saudi Arabia.
But regrettably, their number is limited in terms, I'm talking about the youth, that unfortunately, uh, Mohammed bin Salman would be able to uh, hoodwink them for a while. But the real, the real issues, once again, to recap, is the reaction of the royal family after King Salman dies, and number two, uh, what the Americans would think and what the future would be. But with respect to Saudi Arabia playing a role as the leader of the Muslim world, I don't see that at all anymore. It never did, genuinely speaking. It wasn't a genuine leader of the Muslim world. It simply bought people's loyalties. But now the situation has changed, and uh, it will be very difficult for the Saudis to regain uh, that position uh, even marginally. Our last but very important question to you is, the way Saudi has promoted extremism in Islamic world, uh, specifically in Pakistan, Afghanistan and certain African countries, do you think they will promote liberalism also in these countries so that Saudi maintains their leadership uh, over them? And specifically when they have wealth, it won't be difficult for them to buy muftis and rulers to promote these evils in other Muslim countries also. So do you foresee this to happen? Well, obviously they may try that, but it would be very difficult for them. But we need to keep in mind that um, uh, regrettably throughout history, when uh, ulama have stood up for truth and justice, uh, they have been uh, killed, they have been imprisoned, they have been, uh, attempts have been made to marginalize them. And in their place, uh, what are referred to as court ulama, or we refer to them as scholars for dollars, have been created. And I'm sure that the Saudi regime will try to do something similar, and they might find um, uh, some people to do their bidding. But I think uh, in today's world, with the internet, with the social media, et cetera, there is enough awareness among people worldwide, and in particular among Muslims, to not be swayed by these kinds of um, idiotic policies, these kinds of uh, vulgar policies. Um, you know, if uh, the ulama were to do that, uh, that they would sell their souls, then I think we can say goodbye to Islam. But I have a deep uh, faith in the overwhelming majority of uh, ulama in the Muslim world that they do uh, believe genuinely in the principles of Islam, uh, the injunctions of Islam, uh, Islam's uh, principle of standing up for truth and justice, that they would stand by uh, the truth and justice rather than succumb to uh, petrodollars. Uh, let me add this, um, you know, Imam Ghazali uh, in his Ahyaul um, Ulum uh, al he had made a beautiful comment, advice actually to the Muslims. He said that you should not go to the ulama that stand as supplicants uh, at the doorsteps of the kings. Instead, you should seek advice from those ulama to whom the kings come as supplicants. So we can see that if the Saudis buy some so-called ulama with their uh, petrodollars, that Muslims should follow the advice of uh, Imam Ghazali and not follow such so-called ulama, because these are ulama asu. Uh, these are court ulama. These are scholars for dollars. They should, in fact, follow those scholars that are genuinely committed to Islam, to the principles of Islam, to the values of Islam, and to the revival and glory of Islam. Thank you very much, sir. We really appreciate and feel great honor to talk to you on such serious and important talk. Surely it will help us a lot. Thank you very much once again. It's my great pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Respected viewers, you have listened to Dr. Zafar Bangash's views where he says that Saudi royal family was always corrupt and they have just changed their attire. As far as uprising in Saudi is concerned, he believes it's tough due to operation, but not impossible. And this regime of Saudi can end if America wants to. Whether this wave of liberalism in Saudi will impact globally, Dr. Bangash believes that majority of Muslims globally do not follow Saudi and those who follow are under scholars for dollars and people shouldn't listen to them. 
We hope you have gained a lot from this session and we hope to bring you more such topics with deep insight. A humble request to share this in your circle. Keep watching Besit News. Allah Hafiz.